Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks. And this video is going to be a culmination of many aspects of what I've been trying to figure out in World of Tanks over the last few years about playing tank destroyers. So, tank destroyers, they're often a class that people want to try and camp at the back of the map. Recently, I've been looking for ways to be able to play them more aggressively. And when I say recently, it's pretty much been over the last year or two. Since there were vehicles like the Object 268 version 4 that went into the game that were really bridging the line between a heavy tank and a tank destroyer, I found that I was able to get 70% win solo at tier 10 in an Object 268 version 4 by just taking it to a heavy tank flank and trying to influence parts of the battle that I thought I could win. And so, when I play a vehicle, like the Sturitzwang 103B, you might be thinking, does this look a little crazy right now, diving this absolute wedge of a Swedish tank into an assault on Erlenberg? Now, an assault on Erlenberg, usually a map where a lot of people will either sit at the back, a bit like what the artillery is doing, or even the Centurion Action 10, just a whole 200, 300 meters behind me. Alternatively, you might find tank destroyers trying to sit over in the location just behind the Yag Tiger, or other tank destroyers trying to make their way up on the hill. But I've been trying to play this vehicle a bit more like an offensive medium tank. And this is my free-to-play account, so as you can see, I'm not using any premium consumables. My crew has about three skills, I think, at this stage. I've been playing this vehicle in the mission marathon to try and complete a very pesky mission, TD-15 Triumph for the T-55. Now, I've managed to do this without honours many times. However, I've never managed to actually win the battle and get five kills and 6,000 damage at the same time, at least on this account. So I had a big play session in the Sturitzwang 103B to try and achieve this. And in that play session, I figured out that I took the experimentation that I had on my main account in the UDES, you might remember from a video, that this shouldn't actually work. And if you haven't found out well, if you haven't watched that video about how a turbocharger works on the, on the Swedish tank destroyers, I thoroughly recommend you go and check that one out. But long story short, the turbocharger provides a flat 4 km an hour bonus to a tank destroyer, forwards and 2 backwards. However, it also works inside the siege mode, and so I'm not sure how long that will be the case. Maybe Wargaming will end up nerfing this, but for now, I 100% promise you, if you have a Swedish tank destroyer, get a turbocharger on it, and if you're a free-to-play player like me on this account, I thoroughly recommend you use binoculars and then a gun rammer on this tank. Alternatively, if you're a pay-to-win player and you use premium consumables and you have a really skilled crew, you could probably use the turbo in conjunction with maybe bond-coated optics and bond vents, and then you'll never have to sit still to activate your binoculars. Of course, you're going to lose a little bit of DPM because you won't be using a gun rammer, but I think the luxury of having enough view range with coated optics set up like that will allow you to be very flexible on a ridge line. And you'll be seeing in the second helping of gameplay just how useful that would have been for me, um, which is a luxury that I don't have on my free-to-play account. So, this is my free-to-play setup. We're activating a turbo. And because of this, it allows me to do things in this tank that blur the lines between a tank destroyer and a medium. Now, previously, the Sturitzfang 103B would only be able to go 10 kilometers an hour forwards and 10 kilometers an hour backwards inside the siege mode. With the turbocharger, that's 14 forwards and 12 backwards. That's a 20% increase to my reverse speed and a 40% increase to my forward speed. This allows me in my STRV 103B to try and get into a ridge line like this. This is just the perfect scenario for this tank. You've got enough gun depression with the vehicle. In fact, I believe you can get 11 degrees of gun depression with this tank when you're actually using the hydropneumatic suspension at the back. And that allows you to just dominate ridge lines like this. And when you know about the way that the armor on the STRV 103B works, i.e. with the heat shield on the front of the tank, and also this kind of plow on the bottom that provides a little bit of heat protection as well, when you're playing against tanks that have 120mm calibre guns and lower, they will have a very hard time of trying to deal with you because of the fact that the hull armor on the tank is 40 millimeters thick and it's very angled. So every tank that has a 120 millimeter caliber gun and lower, you will be able to bounce very consistently unless they hit the weak point on top of the tank, which you see up here. And so accordingly, what kind of tanks have those low caliber guns? Well, not the artillery. Oh, luckily he missed me and I set him on fire through shooting his tracks to lock him in place. That was a bit of a weird one. 
But what kind of a, what kind of tanks have 120 mm caliber guns and lower? Well, pretty much all mediums and light tanks, apart from the Soviet vehicles, have a setup like that. And so that means that during this play session on my free-to-play account, with the turbo on this tank, it just allowed me to fight on the ridge line, and I was powering through mediums. I was flanking my opponents. I wasn't sitting at the back. I was getting forward, advancing down flanks with the new top speed limit of this vehicle outside the siege mode, which is going to be 54 kilometers an hour. And that allows you to play this thing as if it's like a medium tank without a turret. And a medium tank without a turret that actually has very good armor against a vehicle like the STRV-103B, against the Conway if he's using the 120mm caliber gun. Not so much against the Gorilla. The Gorilla is going to be able to overmatch pretty much all of this vehicle apart from a couple of plates which go down the upper part of the hull. And then you've got to make sure you never expose your lower plate against vehicles with guns of caliber of larger than 120. Otherwise, they are going to be going through you every single time. And if you see one of these on the battlefield and it's giving you trouble, just ask yourself, do I have heat? If the answer is yes, fire at its lower plate. If I don't have heat, is my gun caliber 121 millimeters? If the answer is yes, then fire AP at the lower plate and you're always going to go through it. So if that game wasn't aggressive enough for you, I'm going to be turning it up literally to 11 in this game. This is this is a lot of practice in this tank. This is a, hundreds of games inside this vehicle, as well as setting the vehicle up in the way that I mentioned, in the complete free-to-play way. And if you're an aggressive player and you, you have hundreds of games in this tank, it's, you're not going to get it immediately. You're not going to know the positions that this vehicle are going to work immediately. But if you practice and practice and practice, the things that you can do in this tank are absolutely outrageous and shocking. Now, I want to highlight just why there's, there'll be a lot of you out there who are thinking, is QB just being completely ignorant by taking tank destroyers and playing them in an aggressive fashion? And I can tell you this, tank destroyers can have a profound impact in the battle, but only if they influence it while the game is winnable. One of the biggest mistakes that tank destroyer players will make will think just because they're playing a lightly armored vehicle with a big gun and it's accurate and they don't want to fight something with a turret in close quarters combat that they're going to sit at the back and then quite often all of the heavy tanks and the medium tanks are going to go to the flank where the battle is actually won and then your team might get rolled over and then unless you have a really fortunate situation where they're weakened and so that they're going you're going to be able to pick them all up one by one by one as they slowly advance at you and the artillery doesn't hit you and the light tanks don't hit you, you can see that there's a lot of things that we're talking about that have to work for a tank destroyer to carry at the back of the map. However, this T-57 Heavy, he fires one that pens me, he fires two that bounces off, and you'll see that I have to point my gun directly at him. You might be thinking, why are you aiming at the T-57 Heavy but shooting at the pattern? Well, obviously I want to shut down the pattern in case he starts shooting my tracks and locking me in, locking me down. It's very important with this tank that you're always aiming at your opponents because if you're not and they hit your side armor at an angle like this, they're always going to overmatch it and they're always going to damage the tank if they have a 91 millimeter caliber gun and larger because the side armor of this vehicle is 30 millimeters. And so we've got forwards. We locked down a pattern who wasn't expecting us to be here and we've started to go to town on the T-57 Heavy as well, or at least we've weathered the storm. Look at this T-57 Heavy. Look at the confidence. He's got two marks of excellence on his tank. Looks like he knows how to play it. You see now, I'm aiming my tank upwards because I know that he's shooting there. And in between my shots, I'm putting my vehicle upwards. And now he's not aiming at the he's not aiming at the weak point on top. Now this means that if you aim upwards above him, that you're actually going to raise the heat shield, and the heat shield is going to absorb the shots where he's aiming for the weak point on top of the vehicle. And while we're down on hit points, that is two vehicles dealt with. We're up to 2,800 damage. And now I'm going to show you exactly what the turbo does inside the siege mode of this vehicle. Well, this is just fortunate. I'm not going to lie. This is just a gift from heaven right now. And this is when you're playing a tank destroyer with outrageous damage per minute, 3,342 base, what you can do to vehicles that make a mistake like this T-10. And what we did to the pattern as well. And that is just outrageous damage to the T-10 there. You cannot make a mistake in front of this vehicle or if it's got its hit points you don't want to trade evenly with a tank like this unless you have a very high dpm most heavy tanks at tier 10 are not even going to have uh, maybe two-thirds of the damage per minute that this vehicle is able to achieve if you're using a build like this where you're using a gun rammer that's definitely going to be the case now you'll notice what I said earlier about the difference in a free-to-play build in this tank and the difference in a pay-to-win build in this tank. If we were 
making a free-to-play build, we have to sit still to activate our binoculars, which is incredibly awkward. Now imagine if you had a pay-to-win build or a very premium build in this vehicle and you were using bond vents and uh, bond coated optics along with a turbo. That would mean that we would be able to go up on this position and would be able to spot all of our opponents at a very decent distance without having to sit still. Right now I'm having to depend on my team to spot the Stritzfang 103B for me and then use my judgment to hopefully be able to finish him off. Oh yes baby! Wham bam thank you man. Managed to shut down that Swedish TD and turn our attention now to the Tiger, And we are just over four minutes into this game, we're at 4,700 damage. Make that 5,000 damage that we've seen and 1,800 spotting. Now, we're a little lucky that we bounced that Yag Tiger because he's got a 128mm caliber gun and he might be able to go through the upper part of this hull at least sometimes. But you've got to take the risks in a situation like this. You've got to get going. You've got to try and go for that 6,000 damage that you see me trying to go for and also the five kills as well. So, YouTube, we need two more kills and I pretty much got the damage done so come on come on just dodging those shells going forwards backwards just hoping that it's not gonna happen hit the leopard here in the turret oh we've got the damage no mr yag tiger i was i guess a little too aggressive but i really felt like we had won this game look at the positions that we have compared to the enemy team we've got them completely surrounded they're making their last ditch attempt you see that they've got their tank destroyers camping at the back of the map not getting forwards, not dealing with the heavies, not dealing with the mediums, not putting the pressure up, not creating a surrounding flanking play with their allies who managed to win the North. And I don't really need to show you the rest of this game for anyone out there who's ever played World of Tanks before to know that this is this is not a situation that they're going to be able to defend out of, at least towards the high tier. Towards the lower tier, that's a different thing altogether. Towards the lower tier, a lot of people have poor view range. Towards the lower tier, a lot of people have low hit points and sometimes the alpha damage is really high. And so you're able to take down your opponents very quickly. But towards the top end, it's usually going to be a case of numbers are very important and also the health bars are just too substantial for even a tank destroyer with really good DPM to bring the vehicles down quick enough before they're surrounded. And that's why I've been having so much more success in a vehicle like this by ramping up the speed and trying to be aggressive with the tank. And by ramping up the aggression and setting your vehicle up in this way is you're going to have big impacts in short games. Of course, if you master the vehicle as well and you know what kind of situation you're getting yourself into, I'm in no way suggesting that everybody go out there and be incredibly reckless in their tank destroyers. This is more of a suggestion saying that have you thought about not camping at the back, even if your vehicle has that incredible accuracy? And the results really speak for themselves. Top on damage here, but more importantly, a lot of experience because we're not just getting our allies to spot for us. In fact, we did 2,000 spotting on Erlenberg. We were spotting for our team as well. And following it up on Sand River, this was a high caliber for 7,000 damage done in our sub-5 minute life as well as in addition 2154 spotting as well nailing us a very big ace tanker at 1296 base experience and because we were running a credit booster at the same time because i'm doing a mission marathon currently yeah i'm never going to complain about making 80,000 credits profit in a swedish tank destroyer seriously on my free to play account i make so many credits by just refusing to use premium consumables and i'm still having very good results. During this play session, maybe I was just playing about as well as I possibly could. We were averaging over about 25 games, I think about a 70% win ratio in this vehicle and 3,600 average damage. And while I didn't quite manage to get TD15 done, at least with honors, I'm hoping that possibly by the end of the marathon, maybe I will have got there. And so to all of you out there who are maybe struggling to be impactful in your tank destroyers, getting frustrated at seeing your team melt and then you're left with an insurmountable amount of enemy vehicles to be able to deal with at the end of the game, I would encourage you to try and engage in the battle earlier. Even if you're putting yourself at risk and if you make yourself feel a little bit uncomfortable at first, just keep going. Possibly you can make it work and as your confidence grows, you might find you have that one game where it clicks and you realize, wow, it's because of my aggressive plays and getting stuck into the battle before the game was actually already lost that I influenced it. And you can build upon that. And as your knowledge of the different maps and the locations grow, then most likely your win ratio will as well. And for all of the practiced veterans of you out there and your Swedish tank destroyers, I can tell you, hands down, I've never been more confident about this 
This vehicle demands a turbo. It's even better than a gun rammer on this tank. This is the most powerful piece of equipment ever to grace Swedish tank destroyers, and it revolutionizes how you can play these things on a ridgeline. So, ladies and gents, boys and girls, that was it for today. Hope you all enjoyed this one. If you did, make sure you give the video a thumbs up. But if you hated it, give it a thumbs down. And let me know what you think about the idea of playing tank destroyers more aggressively and not just sitting at the back of the map. And if you end up giving it a go, let me know in the comments down below whether it worked out for you. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been Epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.